Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a new fascinating study in regards to discoveries about black holes. Specifically discoveries about the Hawking radiation coming from black holes and what we generally understand about what might happen inside a black hole. We're going to discuss the so-called inner horizon. But before we start all of this, well, how do we even study all of this? How can we possibly know anything about black holes if the closest one we know of is like thousands of light years away from us and if it's basically impossible to create an actual physical black hole here on planet Earth? Well, all of the recent experiments in the last few decades have actually been conducted using the so-called black hole analogs or black holes in a tube if you want to call them that because we basically found a way to recreate black hole conditions using other methods, for example liquids, gases and even the light itself. Now the most interesting experiments have mostly been conducted with liquids. For example, not so long ago, the scientists from University of Nottingham used a water tank and a vortex produced in the water tank to study what happens to black holes when different types of waves around the black holes start pushing on the actual liquid itself. The effect that is often referred to in physics as back reaction. And what they realized is that even the vortex waves were actually causing the water to be pushed down as it approached closer and closer to the center to the simulated black hole. And this caused the water level to drop, essentially showing us that these effects were changing the mass of the black hole itself. So the waves around the black hole, the gravitational waves and also the waves of all of this matter falling into the black hole do affect the black hole quite dramatically. Another interesting way of creating black hole analogs is by using quantum effects and specifically what's known as Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a type of a quantum gas that changes the speed of light inside of it. And so by using the property of this gas where it actually can flow pretty quickly and by using the speed of light inside of this gas, it's possible to create very interesting optical analogs to black holes by using the gas and by essentially observing the effects when the light cannot escape the gas because the gas flows much faster. But this particular example is kind of complex and is also not particularly used simply because there is a much better method of doing this. And that's with sound waves. As of today, sonic black holes or sound black holes are actually the most accurate and also some of the easiest analogs we can create here on planet Earth. And as of the last decade or so, there have been a lot of experiments trying to investigate what actually happens inside of these objects. And one of the main reasons they are actually so popular is, well, you can actually learn about this in one of the papers in the description, but in a nutshell, they represent an extremely accurate representation of an actual astrophysical black hole. The sound waves produced in these sonic black holes with either fluid or the gas flowing here, where the sound wave itself is sort of equivalent to a light particle very close to the black hole, allow us to investigate a lot of different effects, including things like Hawking radiation, including things like the event horizon or the inner horizon, and even find out what might actually happen inside of the black hole if you were to cross the event horizon. And that's actually pretty much what the scientists in the recent paper discovered. And if you've ever wondered what happens if you cross the event horizon, and if it's the end of the story for you, in this video you might actually discover that the answer is no, something else might happen. Something that might actually allow you to live inside the black hole for a pretty long time. But obviously they're not the same. So here in the black hole we have the event horizon where no light can escape. But in the sonic black holes we're really mostly talking about the sound wave not being able to escape the very fast flow of the atoms. So in that sense it is already different. At the same time, the main difference between a sonic black hole and a typical astrophysical black hole is really the shape. This one here is three-dimensional, or even four-dimensional if you want to go that far. But pretty much all of the analog black holes, at least using sound waves, have been more or less two-dimensional or, well, even one-dimensional because they sometimes represent a single line. Which makes them much easier to study, but that also kind of maybe presents a few problems because we're not able to study other dimensions. We don't really know if the effects we're seeing are going to be applicable to an object that has a lot more volume and a lot more dimensions. But despite this dimensionality problem, the effects we're observing are still very very similar and in some sense can be interpreted as what would happen inside a real black hole as well. 
For example, in 2010, one such major discovery was in regards to super radiance. The scientists using a sonic black hole were able to discover that by blasting a sound wave into a certain region of the black hole that we normally refer to as the ergosphere, which you see forming around this spinning black hole right here, they were able to receive more energy than they sent into the black hole. Now, this is actually a concept that's been discussed in a lot of different science fiction books and just generally a lot of hard science as well, because today we know that if you were to shine light, for example, into the ergosphere of an extremely fast spinning black hole, the light coming out of there might have a lot more energy than came into the black hole thus allowing us to produce infinite energy by basically using this particular region around the black hole. This particular experiment was able to prove this definitively. And the more experiments have been conducted over the past decade, the more we discovered that a lot of these sonic black holes seem to predict pretty much all of the predictions from astrophysical black holes. This also includes the mysterious Hawking radiation. The radiation we expect a typical black hole to produce simply because Right here at the event horizon, once in a while, one of the virtual particles produced by the quantum fluctuations, which normally happen in vacuum and especially very close to the event horizon, might accidentally fall into the black hole with the other particle becoming a real particle and escaping the black hole. This naturally drains the black hole of mass and makes it smaller and smaller with time. And though Hawking radiation has already been proven by other experiments, including sonic and optical black holes, we still don't really understand if the actual radiation is constant or if it fluctuates with time, kind of like in some sense a flame of a fire or basically a somewhat unpredictable flare star that might have these Hawking radiation events flare up once in a while and then diminish in activity and become a lot uh, less bright. So in other words, one of the questions here is, is the Hawking radiation sort of like a constant glow or is it more or less variable? In more scientific term, what the scientists were trying to really establish now is, is this a stationary radiation? In other words, it doesn't change. And also, is it spontaneous arising from nothing? And one of the latest experiments with the paper that you can find in the description below was able to very accurately simulate all of this by using a very specific gas and by using the sound effects or sound waves inside of that gas. For this experiment, the scientists use rubidium. And although this is a metal, the scientists actually turn it into gas, turn it into, well, basically an analog black hole, with the picture right here representing this analog black hole. And the main principle at work here is that, well, rubidium atoms, at least in gas form, actually flow much faster than the speed of sound inside of these atoms. So the sound wave will actually have trouble traveling inside the atoms if they're flowing at really fast speeds. And this is kind of what the scientists did here. They made the rubidium atoms flow really fast and produce sound waves inside of them, thus creating a kind of artificial black hole on the inside, with the sound waves unable to travel faster than a certain region that in some sense represents the event horizon. Whereas just outside of this region, these sound waves can travel normally. And so here the scientists were looking for similar pairs of sound waves coming from this artificial black hole, with one of the waves moving out and one of the waves moving in, thus representing the equivalent of the Hawking radiation. Except that instead of virtual particles, here we're talking about sound particles or phonons. But since all of this was happening ridiculously fast, they could only really take a snapshot of this and then just repeat the experiment many, many times. Eventually producing 97,000 different pictures that took them roughly around 124 days to measure and to perform. And using the experimental data, they were able to definitively say that the sonic black holes, and by extension astrophysical black holes, definitely have stationary Hawking radiation, meaning that it basically kind of shines like a regular star. They radiate a certain type of radiation constantly without changing much. But what's really interesting about this experiment is that during their study, they were accidentally able to create the other unusual phenomenon inside of their black hole, known as the inner horizon which is that dark part that you see right here, and that's sort of inside the event horizon. Now, the thing about inner horizon is that, well, in between the event horizon and the inner horizon, because now you're inside the event horizon, the gravitational pull actually decreases a little bit, and thus you can sort of stay inside of there 
traveling at the speed of light, and you can actually hypothetically exist in that area without ever falling completely into the black hole. And what's interesting is that they were totally able to recreate this, and they had the sound waves exist in between the inner horizon and the event horizon. Which is kind of where we're located right now in this particular simulation of the black hole. And because the gravitational pull inside of this area is lower than it is right above the event horizon, you can basically travel here, you can exist here, you can survive here, for as long as you don't really fall deeper beyond the inner horizon. Now, the thing is, you cannot escape this though. You cannot suddenly leap out of the event horizon and escape the black hole. So in some sense, you're stuck here. We obviously don't really know what happens here, but by using these black hole analogs, we can maybe one day answer the question of what really happens to objects that are stuck between the event and inner horizons. And another unusual discovery here is that, apparently in between the event and inner horizon, the physics kind of go back to normal. So if something makes it through the event horizon, it suddenly finds itself in a somewhat regular environment, at least for the time being. If that object continues falling into the black hole, past the inner horizon, things change again and probably end up stretching the object to the point where it gets destroyed. But right before that, the physics and the space-time itself is more or less normal as it was right before the event horizon. And that's mostly because the pull of gravity here is a little bit lower than it is closer to the black hole and also lower than it is right above the event horizon. But this is of course for certain types of black holes, usually the ones that we would call supermassive black holes. Smaller black holes or black holes that are not spinning fast enough might not even have these areas. And what's even more interesting is that when this inner horizon was formed inside the black hole, it suddenly started to produce even more Hawking radiation. Which is actually something that's theoretically predicted as well. So in some sense, the scientists in this paper were able to create one of the most accurate representations of an astrophysical black hole. Something that has only been theoretical before this, and something that a lot of scientists will probably try to recreate once again. Which also helps us understand what happens inside the black holes, what happens around them, and possibly also help us understand if any of these effects can be used practically as well. And for now, this experiment does seem to be one of the more interesting and one of the more profound black hole analog experiments. A lot of these results still obviously have to be confirmed and a lot more experiments have to be conducted, but it does seem like the Hawking radiation is indeed stationary. It basically produces a kind of a light that you'd expect from a typical star, and it does look like the more radiation a black hole has, the more likely it's going to have a much more pronounced inner horizon where a certain object can technically survive without really falling into the black hole itself. Here's by the way what a schematic of all of this sort of looks like and you can kind of see both the event horizon and the inner horizon being produced by this very unusual type of a black hole. But I guess until future experiments and until future discoveries, that's kind of all we know about black holes for now and that's all we've been able to discover. Once the scientists discover something else, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon, or by joining the channel membership, or maybe buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye bye.